the Nazis carried out the greatest plundering of treasures in human history. Precious works were seized from within Germany soon after they came to power. Then, during World War II, they would ransack countless pieces of art from the European countries they had conquered. Hitler and Goebbels had almost a hit list of everywhere they wanted to go, all the works they wanted to pillage. It was the biggest looting in the history of art. Colossal. It just drains the imagination to think and to read about the scale of it. But the tide of the war turned, and the Allies now had the upper hand. And as the Nazis made their retreat, it became the task of the Monuments Men to recover all that they had stolen. This was a group of um, people who'd worked in museums or who were art historians. Experts in their field who were charged with going across Europe and finding missing works, cataloging them and returning them back to the original owners. Their mission took them down the deepest of mines and up the highest of castles, the far-flung locations where the Nazis had stored their looted treasures. Many masterpieces were rescued at the last moment, and Herculean efforts were made to save as much as possible from the relentless bombing campaigns. They were very successful, even though there are tens of thousands of items that can't be traced. They all put great efforts into trying to save as much art as possible, and did an enormous job in a relatively short period of time. Not everything was returned, and the hunt continues for the last remaining lost treasures of World War II. The Monuments Men would be formed in 1943, 10 years after the Nazi looting of art began. In 1933, Hitler had been elected Chancellor of Germany. From 1933 onwards, there were many forced sales by Jewish families where the argument is they had very little choice. They either needed the money to flee the country or if they hadn't sold the item at the price specified, they would have been sent to concentration camps or in some other way taken advantage of. A brutal form of compulsory purchase. If negotiation didn't work, the mailed fist, the threat was there and it was used, particularly with Jewish collectors and dealers. They just moved across Europe, taking from Jewish families, from cult cultural institutions, from churches. During the Nuremberg trials, which followed the end of World War II, these art crimes were part of the charges brought up against the high-ranking Nazi officials who were still alive. The confiscation of Jewish homes was carried out as follows. So-called confiscation officials went from house to house in order to collect information as to abandoned Jewish homes. They drew up inventories of those homes and subsequently sealed them. It came up in the questioning and in the interrogation. It wasn't a principal indictment against them. It, it wasn't what was going to hang them, let's put it as crudely as that, because they were being tried for crimes against humanity, planning aggressive war and all that. The planned aggressive war would begin in 1939, when Hitler ordered the invasion of Poland, which marked the beginning of World War II. The invading forces would decimate Polish cities and plunder many of the country's national treasures. In Krakow, the Czartoryski family had one of the finest collections of artworks in the world. The Czartoryskis uh, were one of the great aristocratic families of uh, Poland, and three of their important paintings were seized. There was a Leonardo, a Raphael, and a Rembrandt. Isabella Czartoryska is my six times great-grandmother. She travels around Europe and meets uh, many greats of her time, Rousseau, Voltaire, and Benjamin Franklin, and she starts a museum in her palace. Isabella's eldest son, he travels to Florence and Rome, and with the advice of his younger brother, who is my, uh, my ancestor, 
they uh, acquire the Leonardo da Vinci painting and the Raphael. And they give it as a gift to Isabella because every mother deserves a Leonardo da Vinci. The Czartoryskis had attempted to thwart the invading German army by moving the paintings outside Krakow to a country house, where they were hidden behind a false brick wall. However, they were unable to stop the Nazis from discovering their location. Augustin Czartoryski decides to move the collection from Krakow to one of his estates, then decides it's too close to the Russian front and moves it to my great-grandfather's uh, house in Pełkinie. Very soon the Gestapo turns up and they uh, take the artworks. It was a very calculated operation by the Nazis. These priceless works of art would soon be found in the possession of the Nazi official Hans Frank. Hans Frank, totally irredeemably brutal German governor of most of occupied Poland. He was an avid collector of art treasures, which he looted comprehensively from Poland. Dr. Hans Frank, who was a close personal friend of Hitler's, took those three works, which were you know, number one to Hitler, and hung them in his castle in Warsaw. They knew exactly what they were doing. And the Nazis have uh, appointed an uh, art historian, Kajetan Müllmann, to go around Poland and in search for artworks, among them the, the collection of the Czartoryski Museum. Müllmann, a degenerate, brutal man, but an art historian in his own right, who was an active advisor to the Nazis in Poland and in the Soviet Union as well. There were two factors that influenced what he did and what they did. One that was utter racial contempt for Poland and for the Poles. They thought they had no right to a cultural inheritance of their own. And Hans Frank was, he was simply greedy. He wanted it for himself. With the Nazi invasion and ransacking of Poland, other European nations took great precautions to protect their works of art. The National Gallery in London sent almost all of its collection to far safer locations in Wales. The Louvre in Paris also emptied its contents out of fear of Nazi seizure, a fear that would be realized when German forces invaded in May 1940. Not only were the Germans hiding the looted art, but also the Allies were quickly moving things away as the Germans approached and occupation happened. So the Mona Lisa actually moved six times between different chateaux in the French countryside, almost being chased. With Paris and most of France under Nazi control, Hitler and his high-ranking officials had access to an enormous number of precious artworks. In Paris alone, about 20 confiscation officials confiscated more than 38,000 homes. Looted artworks were stored at the Jeux de Pomme Gallery in Paris, and at the heart of this systematic confiscation was Alfred Rosenberg. He was appointed with Hitler's approval after the fall of France to coordinate the appropriation of art from occupied Western Europe. Rosenberg was a Hitler protege, a dogma idealist, theorist for the Nazi cause. And he was put in charge of the seizure of art in Paris, much of which Hitler wanted for his own museum at Linz. Rosenberg was one of the Nazi officials prosecuted at the Nuremberg trials, where his own reports of the looting that he relayed to Adolf Hitler were used against him. I beg of you, my Führer, to give me a chance during my next audience to report to you orally on the whole extent and scope of this art seizure action, which will be used as a basis for this later oral report, and also accept three copies of the temporary picture catalogs, which too only show a part of the collection you own. He was ruthless in the way that he, he went about it and helped himself to quite a bit. Uh, 
as part of the operation. Rosenberg then closes with this touching tribute to the aesthetic tastes of the Fuhrer, tastes which were satisfied at the expense of a continent, and I quote, I shall take the liberty during the requested audience to give you, my Fuhrer, another 20 folders of pictures with the hope that this short occupation with the beautiful things of art which are nearest to your heart will send a ray of beauty and joy into your revered life, unquote. Rosenberg was in charge of the ERR and the Jeux de Pomme. Now, there were other generals like Goering and so on who were trying to get their share of the booty. The leading Nazi officials had begun following Hitler's example of relentless art collection. The Führer had audacious plans for his own purpose-built museum. But the seized paintings in Paris that he hadn't claimed for himself were highly sought after by Hitler's deputies. But little did they know that there was a quiet spy amongst them who was noting down all they were up to. At the start of World War II, the Nazis had looted extensively across the European countries they'd invaded. But many of the greatest works were kept in the Jeux de Pomme gallery in Paris. Hermann Goering would be a regular visitor there, and he would help himself to many seized artworks for his own personal collection. Some of the Nazi leaders became important art collectors, and that was partly because they had the opportunity, they had the power, so they could seize artworks. It's interesting that Goering, who was such an important Nazi figure, became a very major collector and acquired many, many hundreds of works. His image of himself was of some kind of Renaissance man, a man of culture and of taste. And in fact, I think his interest in art was genuine in its own way. In some cases, he actually acquired works which were officially regarded as degenerate, which is interesting, which shows the contradictions in the Nazi system. So Goering, for example, acquired a number of Van Goghs. He had the maximum of temptation and the maximum opportunity to appropriate what he wanted. Some of them he acquired just in order to sell and make money from, and then he bought more conventional works, but he did also keep some for himself. What is extraordinary is the frequency of these visits. Supposedly, he was Hitler's deputy, Reichs Marshal, in command of the Luftwaffe, but these commitments appeared to be no impediment to the time that he found to make these trips to France. But secretly, it was at the Jeux de Pomme gallery that the work of the Monuments Men, or really, the Monuments Men and Women, began. There was a very brave woman, Rose Valland, who was the uh, curator in the Jeux de Pomme, which is next door to the Louvre, and which was the collecting point which the Germans used in Paris to bring together what they were taking from Jewish families and other museums before shipping it to Germany. She basically pretended to be a collaborator with the Germans. She spoke fluent German, but didn't let them know, and noted where all the big shipments out of the museum, where all the masterpieces were going to, and flagged it to the Allies. She was in a position to be able to register and record everything that was being sent to Germany and to work out where it was going. The records that Rose Vallon kept would prove key in the recovery efforts and she would soon get vital assistance when the United States officially joined the war effort and the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archive program was launched. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. Roosevelt signed a decree in 1943 to actually put together a team of individuals who had the requisite expertise. Now, there's always a big problem when you're doing something like this as to how much military credibility the individuals have to have and how much art history credibility. They weren't normal troops. Obviously, they were sent out to work with the Allied forces, but the average age was 40. They had no fighting experience, so they really were uh, not in their comfort zone. An art historian on the battlefield who can't talk with credibility to a field commander will not get what he needs. 
And somebody who's not an art historian won't know what to do. Altogether, there were several hundred um, people who'd worked in museums or who were art historians who worked for the Allies during the war. And they accompanied soldiers at the end of the war. It was a, originally a United States initiative where the learned societies in America who'd heard about looting in Europe said to the US government, we must do something about this. And they also were aware of the fact that there would be a danger of looting by Allied soldiers who were getting into what had been German-occupied territories. It was always going to happen. It was always going to be part of the, if you like, the moral agenda of the Western Allies to make such restitution as they could to countries that had been looted, despoiled of their own uh, artistic inheritance in the way that occupied countries were. There was every incentive to set up an organization which became multinational, i.e. there were French, Polish, and eventually, of course, German people involved in it, in order to try and safeguard what had been moved or stolen. Uh, and they were very successful. The task was a gargantuan one. The American army claimed at the end of World War II that they had located around a thousand sites, repositories, of what had been hidden away. And did they have the manpower to sort that out adequately or to prevent more of it being stolen and stashed away? We don't, I don't think we know for sure, do we? Two of the most important figures in this new force were George Stout and James Rorimer. Rorimer worked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and was a very important art historian. He later wrote his memoirs as his time as a monuments man. People like Stout and Rorimer were very important art historians and conservators. They were among the leading monuments men. To put together the expertise, you must put somebody in charge of those people who has real military clout clout with the command and indeed the knowledge tactically to be able to know what is safe and what's not safe and how they should progress. George Stout was an ideal figure to help lead this new group as he was one of the few members to have experience of wartime, having served in World War I himself. And he returned to the battlefield of Europe once again, soon after the D-Day landings. The Monuments men would have to make their way across the continent, hunting down secret locations where the Nazis stored their stolen treasures. And the first locations they found were deep mines that the Nazis had to abandon in their hasty retreat. One of the earliest discovered was the copper mine in Siegen, Germany. Cooper says the crowd's booby-trapped the entire place. Could walk right into one. Bring the whole mine down on top of you. Is that true, sir? You found any booby traps? I'm not looking for booby traps. No, sir. The Germans were worried for the safety of artworks. They were worried about um, Allied bombing. Um, so the paintings and artworks were moved from the cities uh, to safe places, uh, initially in the countryside. And it was then realized that the safest place to keep them was in an underground mine. How many tons of rock do you reckon are above us right now? About a million, I'd say. It'd be quick, wouldn't it? All these mines were used to store art when the bombing was clearly a major threat. In these mines were put, in Germany, the items which were going to go to the Führer's museum and so on, and also items particularly from France, which came from the collecting point in the Jeu de Pomme in Paris. You don't worry much, do you, sir? I'm worried now. About booby traps? No. About moisture. Actually happened quite late, before 1945. They started moving pieces across and storing them deep in the mines and there were thousands of tunnels within it, so it really was a case that was very difficult to find. There were large um, cavernous spaces underground where the artworks were stored. It was reputed that at the end of the war, uh, the Nazis had ordered that the mines should be blown up, but fortunately this didn't happen, and it was liberated uh, by American forces and the Monuments Men. I think the sheer scale, volume, 
and beauty of the items that have been taken really amazed uh, not only the commanders but also the troops. And uh, that is what led to everybody understanding what a huge operation the Germans had got into in order to strip Western Europe. And that is without talking about most of the stuff which they took from Russia and Eastern Europe, much more of which was destroyed. The monument's men needed to move fast to rescue any more stolen treasures from the endless mine shafts and castle corridors where they were hidden. Hitler had issued the Nero Decree, which threatened to destroy all of these looted works rather than let them fall into the Allies' hands. On May the 26th, 1944, General Eisenhower gave an order to the Allied forces to protect and respect important historical monuments whenever possible in the battles that lay ahead. The job of the monuments men was to ensure that this order was carried out. On June the 6th, 1944, the D-Day landings at Normandy were put into action under Operation Overlord. The Monuments men made their way across the channel soon after and started to search for the artworks stolen by the Nazis. They knew they had to act fast when on March the 19th, 1945, Hitler issued the Nero Decree from his bunker in Berlin, which ordered for all works to be destroyed rather than let them fall into Allied hands. But the Monuments men would have a stroke of luck when on April the 2nd, they uncovered the German mine at Siegen which held works by the likes of Rembrandt and Van Gogh. Just a few days later, they would make an even larger discovery at a salt mine in Merkers. Here, they found crates of artworks, which included the Winter Garden by Manet. General Eisenhower would visit the mine to see the stolen art for himself, along with his fellow generals, Omar Bradley and George S. Patton they were able to witness for themselves the vast amount of gold that had been found at Merkers. A salt mine, a hiding place for a Nazi horde of gold bullion, currency, jewels, and other forms of wealth. Officers of the American Third Army make an inventory of the treasures which had been removed from Berlin to the Merkers Depository. The almost 200 tons of gold is reported to be virtually the entire remaining bullion reserve of the Reichsbank. A ton of fine gold represents about $1 million. America's hiding place was uncovered by our troops early in April. I mean, it's interesting that General Eisenhower, uh, who had a, a war to fight, chose to be photographed with the artworks which had been recovered. And it was quite a public relations coup for the Americans to show that they had rescued and saved uh, these artworks at the end of the war. Suitcases contain a variety of valuables. It's discovered that the Reichsbank had been buying gold wedding rings, gold teeth, and other loot taken by the Nazis from their innumerable civilian victims. I remember talking to other soldiers from my own regiment who were in Germany at the time. And of course, uh, everybody looted what I would call trophy military kit, you know, swastikas and so on were taken. There were very strict rules about not taking anything which was needed by the German civilian population. We helped repatriate a Bible back to Italy, and there were many cases like that. Valuable works of art are included in the treasure hoard. Approximately 400 rare paintings are found. Removing the Merkur's salt mine hoard takes 24 hours. More than 60 trucks are required to transport it to a central point for storage, pending an Allied decision as to its disposition. These books were found by our staff in connection with the group of U.S. Army people who have assembled these objects of art and are now in the process of returning them to the rightful owners. And the great advantage of salt mines is that they're completely dry. Because they're hygroscopic, you can store things there and they won't degenerate. Naturally, it had perfect conditions, perfect temperature, perfect humidity. And they just started stockpiling all of the masterpieces that they had plundered from across Europe. The Merkur salt mine was a truly remarkable discovery. But the Monuments men would soon unearth an even bigger one, thanks to the work of Rose Vallon back in Paris. 
her meticulous records had allowed James Rorimer to track down an astonishing collection of artworks held at Neuschwanstein Castle. Harry! Harry, come on! Joining him in his discovery was Private Harry Ettlinger, a German Jew who'd escaped to America before the war and was now returning to his homeland as part of the US Army. At the end of the war, there was this big effort by the Monuments Men to repatriate stuff to the country from which it was taken, to make certain these items went back to their original private owners. Neuschwanstein is this fairy tale castle at the foothill of the Alps in Germany, and it was used as a repository or safe place for paintings from the Munich collection, uh, a fantastic gallery. And it's also, more importantly, actually, the destination for art looted from Jews in France. Neuschwanstein Castle, although it looks medieval, was actually built in the 1860s, and it wasn't finished, which meant that it had lots of space, unfinished rooms that adjoin adjoining corridors where they could store multiple pieces of artwork. Tower's over 300 feet tall. At the wartime, there were racks along all of the walls which were absolutely filled with paintings. So there were thousands and thousands of paintings um, in a series of rooms. Then there were the rooms in the main castle itself. Over 300 of them, spread over six floors. I think there were over 21,000 pieces of art stored there. 21,903 pieces of art. These included 5,281 paintings, 684 miniatures, books and manuscripts. It's like something out of a fairy tale. Other rooms with decorative art, with sculpture, uh, jewellery, miniatures, medieval works of art. So they also found there some leather-bound books, cards, references of all the works that were on the list to be looted. Paintings, jewellery, rare books and prints, stacks of furniture, all shipped in from Paris. Gold? <laughs> Only two rooms full of it. But the real treasure is right through here. Well, it's fortunate that the Germans, who were meticulous record keepers, but even so, in the chaos of 1945, anything could have happened. The records of what they had taken were found with the items themselves. The Nazi catalogue of their theft, 20,000 records. Where the items came from, who they belonged to. And you're going to translate it. There were filing cabinets full of the cards showing from whom these pictures had originally been taken, which collecting points they'd gone through, uh, and where they were destined for. So that, for the Monuments Men, would have enabled them to make restitution of these items back to their owners relatively easily. At the same time as the enormous collection at Neuschwanstein Castle was being discovered, yet another stolen art hall was reclaimed, when Hermann Goering was eventually captured. Crying's thief among the high Nazis was Hermann Goering, who looted museums and private collections in all parts of Europe. Much was hidden in caves, and advancing troops captured fully laden freight cars, ready to move much of the collection to safer places for Hermann. When the American army caught up with Hermann Göring's collection down at a small place called Untersee near Berchtesgaden. It had been transported down there with the aid of German military transport and military manpower. What they found occupied 40 rooms of a, a Luftwaffe building. It was a Luftwaffe rest home, which Göring had appropriated for his own use. Apparently, he was shifting it, attempting to, both by road and by rail, and apart from what the Americans, the 101st Airborne Division, who were operating in, in South Germany, tracked down to the Luftwaffe building, there was a lot more that was shifted by rail, and I think the Americans intercepted quite a lot of that as well. Goering's ill-gotten loot is no longer his to admire. 
The collection goes on display for GIs before an Allied commission attempts to return everything to the proper owners. I call your attention again that each of the pictures you have just seen is merely a representative of a large number of similar items illustrated in the 39 volume catalog, which is in itself only partially complete. The stolen art collections of the top Nazi officials were gradually being reclaimed. But the biggest treasure trove of all, that which Hitler had set aside for his own personal museum, was still to be recovered by the monuments men in Austria. But the search continues to this day for all the lost treasures that slipped through the net. In May 1945, the net had closed in on the leading Nazi officials and their stolen art collections. Hermann Goering had been brought into custody by the Allies, along with his enormous haul of artworks. And Hans Frank, the governor of occupied Poland, had been captured by US forces near the German-Austrian border. He had an extensive collection of looted paintings, including the famous Czartoryski collection which featured The Lady with an Ermine by Leonardo da Vinci, The Landscape with Good Samaritan by Rembrandt, and The Portrait of a Young Man by Raphael. Both Goering and Frank would eventually be tried at Nuremberg. At the end of the war, in 1944, when they were evacuating Poland with the Russian invasion from the east, Dr. Frank took the Leonardo and probably the others back to his own private residence in the south of Germany. Frank took the pictures um, to his country house and two of them were later recovered, uh, the Rembrandt and the Leonardo. The Raphael is still missing and it's possibly the most important artwork that was looted and lost during the war. Right down here, sir. Frank insists he didn't steal them, says he was just safeguarding them. We found it just lying here on the floor. Have a look. The Leonardo, it's a very important portrait, and um, it had a boot print on it, and um, it's lucky it didn't suffer more damage. Is that it? A boot, sir. Yes. Whoever was in here earlier sure will get out in a hurry. Oh, jeez. There's a famous photograph of it on a railway platform, and fortunately the painting um, survived in relatively good condition, considering its checkered history during the war, and it's now one of the most important Leonardo's. It's been estimated that over 800 objects are missing from the museum, and among them, the Raphael. The Raphael is still missing, and it's possibly the most important artwork that was looted and lost during the war. Portrait of a man, and many people think it's actually a self-portrait of Raphael. Sadly, only one was never found, Raphael's portrait of a young man, and that was last seen at Varvel. And there have been some supposed sightings of it. There was speculation that uh, maybe after 50 or 70 years, it might turn up somewhere when supposedly the case expires. There were thoughts of it being locked in a bank, which then got proved to be a hoax. So it's largely thought now that it is missing. We have no evidence of what happened to it. And it's just possible it might turn up in someone's attic at some point. The Raphael painting may be the most famous missing work from the Czartoryski collection, but many other great pieces of art have still not turned up. This 15th century work by Italian artist Naroccio de Landi is still missing, as is a work called Saint with a Book that was stolen to order for Hitler's private collection. Hans Frank and Hermann Goering's stolen caches of art had been recovered, but the greatest collection of all had been assembled for the Führer himself. He had plans for his own purpose-built art museum in his hometown of Linz and its vast contents were being stored in a salt mine elsewhere in Austria. There was a great sycophantic effort by senior Nazis to, to suck up to Hitler. 
And one of the things they did when they put together these items which they confiscated in France or other countries was then to record them in leather-bound volumes for him and eventually those leather-bound volumes would have presumably been part of the inventory for the Linz Museum. And then some of those volumes were discovered by the Monuments Men. By early 1945, Hitler was dead and Germany had surrendered, which meant that the Monuments Men were now racing against the invading Soviet Union to get to Hitler's vast collection. Getting to the sites where the Monuments Men guessed there would be valuable stuff that could be found. I don't think that could ever be a military priority, of course. They had given up in Berlin by March 1945. It was really an unadmitted deal that the Soviets were going to get to Berlin first. But as the byproduct of ultimate military victory, there came access to the sites. The Monuments Men were on their way to their final target, which held the biggest treasure trove of all. Their mission thus far had seen many successful recoveries, but much had been lost forever in the fighting. In Florence, Italy, bridges that had been designed by Michelangelo had been blown up by the retreating German forces. And in the Battle of Monte Cassino of 1944, Allied bombing had brought the centuries-old abbey to ruins. It was a fanatically defended and almost impregnable German position on the way to Rome if the Allies were to advance up Italy. Monte Cassino was the pivotal position they had to take. There was no question about that. But the price, apart from the lives lost, was the destruction of the Abbey. Prior to the onslaught of the Allies on the monastery, the Hermann Göring SS division offered its services to the Benedictine abbot of the monastery to shift from the monastery's cellars. So they shifted something like 100 truckloads of stuff, priceless stuff, from the abbey's cellars, shifted it north to Spoleto near Rome. And needless to say, some of the shipment found its way to Hermann Göring's <laughs> personal collection. Bombing campaigns had also caused huge damage to the Campo Santo building in Pisa. Dean Keller of the Monuments Men did everything within his power to rescue what he could amongst the ruins. But there was danger of a truly catastrophic loss of works occurring if the Monuments Men didn't get to Altersee in time, where Hitler's collection was being stored. The Nazi in charge of the mine was planning on blowing the whole thing up. The Gauleiter in charge, when he received the so-called Nero decree from Hitler, which said that everything was to be destroyed, that order was, of course, countermanded by many local commanders and countermanded by Speer in relation to things like the bridges in, in Berlin. So 90% of the Germans knew that that was a stupid order. But this guy, who was a dedicated Nazi, he tried to destroy everything in the mine by planting bombs in it. What happened eventually, he planted six bombs in the mine. Those bombs were removed by the miners and his own troops. And then one bomb was blown up at the entrance to make it look as though all of them had been exploded. And that was really to fool their commander. When the Monuments men were able to make their way into the Altersee mine, they were astonished by what they found. Hitler thought of himself in a bizarre way as a trustee for the German people of an art collection that he could build up thanks to the opportunities that war and victory provided. In the Altrausi mine were some of the best works which Hitler himself wanted for his own collection. Leda and the Swan, the Vermeer astronomer, there were some of the really best possible pictures which were stored there. Among the paintings which were for the destined for the museum, there were a couple of Vermeers. Uh, there was one from the Channing Collection in Vienna and another from the Rothschilds family in Paris. Hitler didn't luxuriate in his own collection in the way that Goering did. Uh, a lot of what Hitler collected was kept stored, carefully documented and photographed. Hitler, of course, entertained the fantasy of a 
an art museum at Linz, close to where he was born in Upper Austria. We have these images, and in fact, there's photographic proof of Hitler, even in the final days of the war, pouring over the grandiose architectural plans for this museum in Linz. This is typical of the important works of art, the masterpieces, which were seized by Hitler for his grandiose museum. It was the biggest concentration of art probably ever assembled in the world, I should think. Astonishing episode, because there was so much there. And it was perfect because of temperatures, and it was well thought out from the Germans' point of view. And it was an extraordinary treasure trove of what the Ghent altarpiece was there. The Ghent altarpiece from the Cathedral of St. Bavo um, has had a very checkered history in that it was been seized during wartime on a number of occasions. There's some descriptions of them finding the altarpiece and coming across these works. They had no crates, they didn't have proper equipment, so really they were finding these works which we now know as sort of the forefront of the history of art, but we're covering them in jackets, gas masks to transport them. The Michelangelo Madonna of Bruges was also there. Extraordinary. Michelangelo's Madonna at the church in Bruges is very important, one of the greatest Renaissance sculptures. And uh, during the war, that was seized by the Germans. That was taken by German soldiers when they were retreating in 1944. Uh, they were taken uh, actually in a Red Cross truck, so in breach of every Geneva Convention as well as in breach of the Hague Convention, as it were. Hitler's vision of a post-war future was of everything that he'd acquired going down to Linz. Goring, in a curious way, vied with Hitler. There was rivalry between them. But in a strange way, both of them were thinking ahead to the future of a, a Reich that was going to last for a thousand years, and they had obligations to, the, to Aryan people to let them see this stuff. They knew what they were looking for. I think it's easy to think of just a few key places like Altersee, but actually I think there was over 1,500 locations found by the American army in Germany alone, let alone all across Europe. So there were these sort of safe houses of artworks. There could still be more out there. In fact, just a couple of years ago, a painting by the Polish artist Alexander Gorymski, which had been looted in World War II, turned up at an auction in Hamburg. It was returned to its original home of Warsaw, and its discovery indicates that other missing artworks could also be found someday. The estimates, the figures, conflict fairly wildly, don't they, about the, the total that was, was stolen. Virtually all of the items which are missing are on our database, and we are looking for them all the time. Now, they may have been sitting in an attic for 80 years now, and when they're discovered, nobody knows what they are. So it's necessary to have our searching procedure, searching three or 400,000 items a year, in order to find those items that have not yet been returned. But one thing's for certain. If it hadn't been for the Monuments Men, so much of Europe's history and greatest achievements would have been lost forever. <laughs>